right, let's hop in. Uh, yesterday, if you missed it, we had um, we covered the prepping the house for sale, right? We've been working on the listing process. We talked about the listing presentation and getting that listing agreement signed. And then we talked about from signed listing agreement to on market date. So today we're going to talk about um, working that active listing, um, getting into contract and then contract to close. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask your questions. If you're watching this on a repeat, feel free to throw your, com your questions in the comments section. I believe I get notified when people make comments, so I can log in there and answer those questions for you, or you can reach out directly to me. Um, I am watching the chat box as well, so you can throw it in there and I'll try to catch it as soon as you ask it. Sometimes it takes me a little bit of time, um, but let's get started. I'm just finishing rearranging my window here because it's getting cut off. I need like four screens for Zoom, I've decided. Two is not enough. All right, <laughs> so <laughs> listings, contract to close. Our learning objective today is uh, showing the property. No offers, now what? Oh, I didn't put a slide in for that. Negotiating the sale, opening escrow, be a problem solver and create customers for life. Uh, those are our learning objectives. So showing the property, we talked about uh, yesterday, if you didn't catch that one, go back and watch that video, um, the email templates that I have. And one of those, the last one, sets up the sellers for successful showings. It talks about the expectations you have for the, the sellers when those showings are scheduled. Um, things like turning on all the lights, opening all the windows, making the house a comfortable temperature, removing old dog, pet, cat items right out of the house, um, doing those. So um, now we actually, you know, we set those expectations. Now we actually need uh, showings to be scheduled. So when we put that listing into the MLS, we want to make sure we do that with instructions. And your instructions may vary and change depending on where you're at in your business, what you want to utilize, what you don't want to utilize. So that's why scheduling there has a question mark. You may decide that you just want uh, agents to text you for showings. You may decide that you want to utilize Calendly and you'll put that link inside of the um, MLS so that people can click on that Calendly link to schedule showings on the property. You also want to make sure these sellers have access to that Calendly calendar so that they can see when there are uh, showings scheduled. I happen to use showing time. I like it. I'm sorry for those that are anti-showing time. I love showing time. Um, if there was another system that was similar to it, I would absolutely utilize something different, but that's the only one I've found so far. And it takes me out of the equation and it puts the sellers in charge. So it gives the sellers the ability to approve or deny. If they deny, they can suggest another time. Um, I can see how long it's taking sellers to respond to requests. So if they don't get in there and get it responded to fairly quickly, um, I can override it. It allows me to, if we're having open houses, and maybe the showing instructions are by appointment only. During that open house time frame, I can go in there and override those instructions. So if somebody tried to schedule a showing during the open house, it would just automatically approve them. Or if sellers were gonna be out of town for the day, I could set it in there to just be a go and show. So when they try to schedule, it automatically approves them. It doesn't go to the sellers. So there's lots of options inside of showing time. That's why I like it. And I don't have to be in cell service or reception the entire time I have listings on the market in order to schedule those showings. So figure out what you're gonna use for scheduling and create systems and processes around it is the bottom line there. You wanna make the seller part of the team, right? So the seller needs to be part of the team. Um, you wanna talk with them about when they're available for showings. Um, we want to make sure that our seller leaves for those showings, that we don't interrupt things like nap time if they've got small kids or that, um, you know, all that. And then the sellers can collect those cards after the agents show the property. The seller can shoot you. You can say, hey, after you return home from the showings or from your day at work, if you could just shoot me, um, you know, uh, images or pictures of the cards that were left behind, I'd really appreciate that. Right. So make them part of the team. Um, and you, you know, what? something else that's really important too, is to let your sellers know that not all agents leave cards behind. I am notoriously horrible for remembering to leave cards. COVID made it worse because I had problems before COVID. And then when COVID happened, we actually weren't even supposed to leave cards anymore. 
And now we're back to leaving cards. Well, now I'm completely out of the habit. So it's really hard for me to leave cards, but um, let your sellers know all that to say, let your sellers know that not all agents are going to leave cards behind um, and to not freak out and think that they didn't show the property just because there is no card. Um, the other thing I like about showing time is that it solicits the agents that show the property for feedback, and then you can share that feedback directly with your sellers. So I do like that feature as well. As far as making the seller part of the team, um, again, collecting cards, calling you, they can watch the flyer box if you use one and let you know when it's nearly empty. Uh, flyers are, you know, tree killers. No, anyways, I, I would find it way more effective to have like a QR code on your sign that allowed people to scan the QR code to get the information on the property than a piece of paper. That's just me. So I don't use flyer boxes, but if you do, um, you know, check in with the seller and ask them how the flyer box is doing. Ask them how the sign looks, right? Like, cause sometimes the signs start leaning. Um, and then as far as those showings, uh, I usually use that, the Barry's Bluetooth lockbox there on the property. So only agents can get access. However, we have an increasing number of agents coming from out of the area that haven't co-opt their key with Barry's. So you may also want to put a contractor's box on that property so that you don't have to show up and let those other agents in. I would verify that they're an agent before you give them access to those lock boxes and um, never put that you have a contractor's lock box in the MLS, you will get your hand slapped and you will get in trouble. Any questions about that information there on showing the property? All right, moving right along. Um, contact all the agents that have shown the property for feedback. Ask them what they thought. Again, that's why I like showing time is it solicits them. And then I only have to follow up on like half of them that don't respond to that. Um, don't ever defend the listing or the price, right? Your job is just report. You're going to stay professional and neutral. So you're just going to ask them what they thought. If they're like, oh my gosh, they just thought it was priced too high. Um, or, you know, sometimes if agents, I call them for feedback and they go, oh, they really like the property, but they decided to go with a different property. You better believe I'm going to get in there and be like, oh, do you mind me asking which property they ended up making an offer on? Because I want to know who our competition is. Who are those buyers looking at in addition to us? And who are they choosing over us? And that way I can go in there and kind of stalk them on the MLS and look and see what the property was that they submitted an offer on. Was it cleaner, nicer, bigger, smaller, right? I just want the details. Um, and then be cautious about the info you reveal to buyers and buyers agents, right? And this goes for during your open house time period. This goes for when you're on the phone with agents. Remember your fiduciary duty is to the seller and that confidential information that the seller tells you about why they're moving or what they've got going on. They may not want you sharing with other people because it may affect how somebody decides or what somebody decides to offer on the property. So just be cautious about the information that you reveal. Any questions about showings and seller reporting as far as that goes? <clears throat> Once a week, I usually provide a report back to my sellers if we don't have offers on the property. Um, with how many showings we had, any feedback that we had, if we had an open house, how many parties went through the open house. Um, you can look up on like Zillow and Realtor.com and see how many views your property is getting. In fact, um, inside of our one zone, there's a service as well. I can't think of what it's called, but it allows you to check the activity on your property there as well. So um, I like to kind of fill that out and shoot it off to my sellers. I usually do that on like a Monday or a Tuesday, and then I will call them and follow up with them the next day. Um, we, all right, we're going to back up. We're going to stay here on showing the property. If you're not getting offers on your property, now what, right? Now we need to look at, is it just the market, right? So we put our property on the market. It came on last Wednesday or Thursday. We've been on the market maybe a week, maybe two weeks, haven't gotten an offer yet, what do we do? Number one thing I wanna do is I'm gonna go back and look at how many showings have we had? Have we had a lot of showings and just no offers? Have we had no showings, right? Everything indicates something different. Do, if I look at the rest of the market and repull comps, are, do we seem to be priced appropriately? Are we priced a little bit too high? Has the market shifted and snuck out from underneath us? 
Um, what's the feedback that we're getting, right? And I want to take that and have an educated conversation with my sellers. So if we've been sitting on the market and there hasn't been any showings, then we probably have a pricing issue, right? We probably need to do some sort of pricing adjustment. If you've already had one automatically built into your listing agreement, then it's just you know, waiting for the time frame of when we're going to reduce that price. I do like to call it a price adjustment rather than a price reduction because it doesn't sound as scary if we talk about a price adjustment. Um, if you've got a lot of showings and just no offers yet, the feedback is good. We just haven't gotten offers. Then I would say, hey, let it ride a little bit longer and see what happens, right? Our general rule of thumb is like if you have less than five showings or so in like a week period, then we probably need to do something with our price versus we're getting a lot of showings and no offers, okay? And also, again, we want to look at what's going on with the other homes in the market in that price range in that city to see what's going on with those. Are they all sitting just a little bit longer? Are we starting to see a shift in the market? Are all of them going and ours isn't? Definitely have a problem, right? Is it that when people walk up to the property, the front porch has like this overhang and it's completely rotted out and needs to be removed. And so people just don't want to deal with that. And they're afraid they see that overhang and they're like, oh my gosh, if that's rotten, who knows what else is going on with the house, right? Is there something we need to do to improve the curb appeal or some quick, easy fix that we could do to make the property shine? So we want to make sure we look at all of those options if we're not seeing movement on our property that's in line with the current market. Okay, in line with the current market would be my guideline for that. Any questions about price adjustments or being in line with the current market? All right, now we've priced it appropriately. It's on the market. We've got activity. And finally, we get an offer. Our offer arrives. Please do not contact your sellers when the agent calls you and says, hey, my clients are going to write an offer. I should have it to you tomorrow. Please don't call your sellers and be like, hey, we should have an offer by tomorrow because we don't count offers until they're in our hands. Um, I won't say more often than not, but I'm thinking it. Um, people say, oh, I've got an offer coming to you. And then it fizzles out and you never actually receive it. So we don't count those offers until we're in our hands. We don't tell our sellers about it. We can get excited like, oh boy, finally, we're going to, it sounds like we're going to get an offer, but we don't want to jump the gun and get them excited too, because it's harder for them when we let them down than let ourselves down. Um, there's a couple different ways for which you can submit offers to your seller for review. You can do it in person or you can do it electronically. I actually like to um, do it in person if I have multiple offers on the property. I feel like it's just easier to... Um, have that conversation with the sellers and kind of walk them through each offer. And just so everybody knows too, I don't generally send them the offer itself. I usually send over a summary of the offer. So I have a um, listing comparison or an offer comparison where it lists the offers side by side. Um, you put all the terms in, what kind of loan it is, what the down payment is, what the deposit is, the contingency periods. Is it contingent on the sale of another property? Or are they allowing the sellers that rent back they asked for? And then I put a little summary at the bottom. So that's usually what my sellers get initially. <clears throat> because for them to try to sort through a 13-page offer, they're, they're going to forget what it said at the very beginning. By the time they get to the end of one, forget if they have to get through three or four. So I usually do the side-by-side um, -side comparison. If I just have one offer or there's a clear winner, then I may do um, I may uh, so present the offers to them over the phone. Um, so it, and it just depends on my sellers too and what their comfort level is and what they would prefer. And are they even in the area or are they out of the area, right? So um, <clears throat> you can decide how you want to submit those and present those offers. I do let my sellers know when I get offers, even if on my listing agreement, I put that we're not reviewing offers until Tuesday at 6 p.m. If I get an offer on Sunday, I'm going to call the sellers and or shoot them over text and say, hey, just a heads up, we got our first offer in. Oftentimes at that point, I haven't had a chance to look at it or I have, and then I might say I haven't had a chance to look at it or I took a peek at it. It looks like it's, you know, at asking or slightly above asking, but we aren't reviewing offers until Tuesday. So um, we'll see what else happens over the weekend, right? Or over the next couple of days. And I'll keep you updated, right? So whatever that might be. And be prepared to provide a net sheet for each offer. My side-by-side um, -side comparison kind of shows them 
not with their bottom line is, but with what the offer is with the things that the buyers have asked them to pay for. They've usually already received an estimated net sheet from me. Um, and so it just kind of adjusts, but I don't necessarily do a full net sheet for each and every offer. Um, any questions on that? All right. Um, we want to be able to negotiate those offers. It's a very rare occurrence that an agent submits an offer to me that doesn't require some sort of counter or cleanup. Um, please be really good when you write your offers so that you don't have to have counter offers or cleanup, but oftentimes they leave things out. They put seller's choice for the NHD report, which is an actual company. So it wants to be seller could choose, right? There's little things. Um, people just forget to put things in there. They don't spell the seller's names correctly, whatever it is. So when we go into this negotiation period, we really want to make sure that we fully understand the offer and what's in there. The really nice thing now is that we've got that really cool grid on the RPA where everything's on those first three pages where before things used to get like hidden throughout the offer. And we don't have to worry about that as much. So it makes it a little easier. Um, you can learn scripts for presenting less than perfect offers, right? So, um, things like, um, <laughs> the offer is not full price. As I told you would most likely be the case. It doesn't appear to be a, it does appear to be a strong offer. However, we'll go over the entire offer when we are together and discuss options of how we will answer the buyer, right? If the offer is really a low ball and contains unrealistic terms, then you might want to say, hey, I'm afraid the offer is rather off the mark. However, the buyers went through the trouble of putting it in writing. So let's give them the courtesy of an answer. I'll look forward to seeing you at 6 p.m., right? I always encourage my sellers to counter the offer. Let's play ball with them. Sometimes buyers just come in really low with the hopes of getting a deal and the hopes that at least maybe the seller will play ball and come down a little bit. Like if we come down lower than they think they will, then we'll end up at the seller's bottom line, right? So um, so I never write an offer off. Sellers get offended really easily. I'm sorry, it just happens. That's why they hire us because we are business professionals and they are emotionally tied to their property. Um, so we wanna try to keep it in a business perspective and try to keep them out of that offended, right? And, and you know, something that I use a lot is um, the buyer's agent is just looking to get the best deal for the buyer, right? Whereas my job is to protect you and help you get the most amount of money for your property. So we've got opposite goals in mind. And so the, the buyer's just trying to do what they can do to get the best deal possible. All we have to do is counter them and see if they're willing to play ball with us with something that's more reasonable, right? And people seem to like that. But we just explain the roles. Um, let's see, go for win-win solutions when negotiating, right? And oftentimes before I counter somebody, I'm going to be on the phone with that other agent having a conversation with them. Hey, your buyers, they came down like 10,000 off asking price. They also asked for a $10,000 closing cost credit. We're probably going to counter this. I haven't um, fully discussed it with my sellers yet, but chances are we're going to counter it. What is more important to your buyers? Is it more important to them that the price is lower or more important that they get that closing cost credit? right? Have those type of conversations. Hey, your, your um, buyers asked for X, Y, and Z. Can you explain to me what's important to them about those items, right? We want to have an understanding going into talking with our sellers about those offers so that we know the best course of action to respond in a way that's going to create a win-win scenario for both parties and a way that's going to get this property in contract and get it closed. Okay, we want to go, um, you've got options if you're going to counter, right? So when you receive an offer, we can either accept the offer as is, we just sign on the dotted line and we call it a day. We can counter that offer or we can reject the offer, right? Those are the three options. If you're going to reject an offer, please at least do um, the bare minimum and let the other agent know. You can text them and just say, hey, your offer was far below where my sellers are willing to or the offer, the terms are far outside what my seller's willing to do. Um, they're not going to accept your offer or even counter it at this time. Do you need a formal response on that? 
right? Just let them know it's not that hard. And most agents will be like, no, I don't need a formal response. Thanks for letting me know. But it's worse when you just get hung out to dry and you're like, hey, did you receive my offer? Yeah, we received it. Well, okay, it's been four days. Why didn't you respond? Oh, well, they're not going to accept it. Well, why didn't you just tell me, right? So do the, the best that you can as an agent and communicate with the other agent. If you're going to counter it, you have two options. You've got your seller counter offer. So if you've received one offer or multiple offers and you're just going to counter one of them, you would use the seller counter offer. It's just a straight counter offer. Buyer made me an offer. Seller's now offering the buyer a new offer, um, some changes to theirs. If the buyer signs that they accept that counter offer, we are now officially in contract. That's the end of the road. Okay. Um, there's also a SMCO, which is the seller multiple counter offer. If you've got multiple offers in hand and you want to counter more than one offer at a time, we can do a seller multiple counter offer. The terms and everything doesn't have to be the same on each of those counter offers. It could be significantly different. Um, it just allows us that we can um, counter multiple offers. And then if all the buyers accepted our multiple counter offer and sent them back to us, it doesn't officially obligate us into contract until the seller picks the final counter offer that they're gonna go with. In that time frame, somebody may submit a new offer that's better than any of the offers we countered, we can actually move forward with that other offer. We don't have to accept any of the counter offers. Um, so, and we kind of already talked about price and terms, but not both, right? Um, does anybody have any question about negotiating offers? As we move through this process, you guys will notice that I keep saying communicate, communicate, communicate. Please don't hesitate to pick up the phone and talk to the other parties involved. Call the, the lender for the offers that you received, verify the information, verify those lenders have actually like seen and reviewed their income and asset documentation, that they've pulled a credit history, ask if the underwriter's seen the file yet, ask if they've run what's called a DU approval on it or an automated approval right? Ask those questions of the lender so you know how qualified these buyers really are and how deep the lender is dug into this file um, so that we kind of know the likelihood of them being able to close it. Have conversations with the other agent. Talk about the things that you don't think are going to appeal to your seller in their offer and ask them what they think. I don't want to have to counter five or six times back and forth. I want it to be one clean offer or counter offer that we can all agree on and move forward it just makes it less messy. And so I'm never hesitating to pick up the call and or pick up the phone and have conversations, not just text messages, but actual conversations with those other agents. All right. Once we have reached an agreement, we've accepted an offer, we countered, they accepted, we multiple countered, we picked our favorite one. Then we're going to open escrow on the property. We are now officially in contract which is where we start that contract to close process. Um, I highly recommend that you follow a checklist. I know I've shared it with you all before in the um, mentees folder, but I can share it again. We have a listing transaction checklist that goes through like all the possible things that could happen during a transaction in the ideal order in which they would happen. Not that anything happens in an ideal world, but if it did, that would be the order in which they happen. So you can use that checklist. You can start creating your own, tweak it, change it. I do recommend that you hire a transaction coordinator. Um, I do recommend that if you haven't completed one transaction on your own, that you complete at least one transaction without a transaction coordinator. The reason I recommend that is that if something happened to your transaction coordinator, I don't want you to be dead in the water. I want you to understand how the process works, how the transaction flows, what to expect, what gets sent back and forth, how irritating, um, convert, you know, uh, following up with other people's agents and transaction coordinators is so that you know what your transaction coordinator is going through. Um, transaction coordinator usually is going to cost somewhere between $300 and $600 per transaction. You only close once or only pay once it's closed. So it's well worth every penny to hire that transaction coordinator. But again, do um, take care of one transaction on your own. Um, make sure that you communicate with your clients during this phase and set expectations. So I say this a lot too, right? I say that, hey, when we talk with our sellers or our clients, before we get off the phone, we always set the expectation of when they're going to hear from us next. Okay. It's never just like uh, some point, right? 
Um, at the very least, you're going to be touching base with them once a week. It's probably going to be closer to like three times a week minimum for your sellers during the escrow period. You're going to be letting them know when uh, the appraisal is scheduled. You're going to be reminding them of inspections, making sure the inspection timeframes work. Um, you're going to be going over the results of the appraisals, um, letting them see copies of the inspection reports, negotiating repair requests making sure all their disclosures are filled out, right? So we're going to have all this communication. And even if we're not sure what we're going to communicate with them next, if it's Monday, and I think we're probably good, I'm going to say, hey, I'll touch base with you on Wednesday if we, and let you know kind of where we're at, right? Just, hey, here's what we're doing. Make sure that you communicate as well with the other agent and the lender, right? So be checking in with the lender on a regular basis. I haven't heard from the appraiser. Has it been scheduled? Did you put me as the point of contact? How are we doing on underwriting? Are they getting all the conditions in, right? Have those conversations with the buyer's lender and the same thing with the other agent. Just continue to be in contact constantly with them. I almost would recommend to not go a day and definitely not more than two days without some sort of communication, a text message, phone call with that other agent. Okay, we want to make sure that they know, hey, the line of communication is open. If something's happening, if something's going on, if you need help with something, if we're not getting what we want, like, let's figure it out together. We need to work as a team. We're all working towards getting the transaction closed. Okay, the steps to a successful transaction are, number one, we're going to open escrow. If you pre-opened escrow, um, it's kind of the same process. We're just going to send over a copy of that executed, the fully executed and signed purchase contract, along with any um, counter offers and any amendments. I'll go over to the title company, your escrow officer. You want to make sure to complete that agent visual inspection disclosure. You're avid. You want to do that within 24 hours, ideally, of opening escrow. Okay, 24 hours of an accepted contract, that's when we want to do our AVID sometime in that period. If you have to fudge it and do it a little long, there's no contractual obligation as to the date that the visual inspection is done. So that's just my general rule of thumb is you want the record of that property as close to accepted offer as possible. Ensure that all your disclosures are completed by the seller and you want to send those to the buyer's agent. That includes ordering and signing off on the NHD report or the natural hazard disclosure report. Your buyers or the buyers are going to complete their investigation of the property, have inspections done, review inspection or review disclosures, review all the information they have about the property. Um, the appraisal is also going to be ordered and done. I highly recommend. Oh, that's what I should add in next week. Sorry. I have a couple of free sessions next week that aren't scheduled in yet. One of those will be my appraisal packet. I'll show you guys what I do for the appraisal. Um, so we want to make sure that we that appraisal gets scheduled. If it's not, we're on the phone with the lender communicating and asking them when to expect a phone call from the appraiser. We always meet the appraiser at the property on our listings, unless there is no appraisal contingency and no inspection contingency. And the reason I say both is because if my appraisal doesn't come in at value and I have no appraisal contingency, but I still have an investigation contingency, the buyers can easily cancel out on the investigation contingency based on a low appraisal. So um, other than that, I'm there to meet the appraiser with my appraisal packet. Um, then you're going to negotiate any repairs. And then we make sure all the contingencies get removed or we serve those notices to perform. And then we are going to prepare to close escrow. That's kind of the steps to a successful transaction in a nutshell. Any questions so far? Everybody is so quiet today. All right, it's closing time. So now how to handle our, oops, how to handle the closing. Um, number one, the contractual obligation for your seller is that they should leave the property swept clean and free of any trash or debris, okay? They don't have to have the house professionally clean. You should always with your buyers set them up for that expectation, but you can let your sellers know they start stressing towards the end and packing and moving always takes longer than they think it's going to. 
So it's a good time to just remind them like, hey, just so you know, contractually, all you're obligated to do is like a quick wipe down of your cabinets, sweep and clean, you know, a quick wipe down of the bathrooms and floors, make sure all the trash is removed and make sure there's no personal belongings left behind. And they're gonna be like, oh, okay, well, I'm still gonna try to get it like really clean. And you're like, perfect, I would too, absolutely. But if push comes to shove, you don't have to. Um, the sellers can cancel their utilities on the scheduled date of the close of escrow. Right. If we're on track for closing on time, that's a good time then for your, your sellers to call and start canceling utilities. Contractually, they're required to leave the utilities on through the close of escrow. OK, so not just through inspections, but through the close of escrow. And especially as it's getting hotter, that's super important because we want sprinklers continuing to go off, which need power and uh, water to keep those lawns green or the flowers intact, right? So we don't want to cancel utilities until the end, but they can schedule that once we know we're on track for the close of escrow. They want to make sure they leave systems ready for the buyers. That would be like if they have a ring doorbell or a nest thermostat or a solar panel system that has a online monitoring they need to figure out how to release those systems out of their name and set them up for the buyers to be able to put them in their name and be able to monitor those items remotely. Um, any extra keys and remotes or instructions or user manuals or anything, I usually instruct my sellers to leave those in one of the kitchen drawers. Okay. The buyers and the buyer's agent can access the key that's in the lockbox to get the key for the property when it's time to deliver keys. Everything else stays in the house and gets locked up inside of there. If they have like, you know, if they have like three extra keys, they may put two in the drawer and lock up one last time as they're walking out the door. And I just tell them to throw that key away. Um, is the seller remaining after the close of escrow, right? So if there is a seller in possession after the close of escrow or an RLAS, a residential lease after the close, then these items still apply, but it's just going to move from the actual close of escrow to the date that they vacate. And I always do a walkthrough of the property before the keys are delivered to the buyer. Okay. After my sellers leave, or as they're getting ready to pull away, I want to be there to do a final walkthrough to make sure that in fact, the property is free of trash and debris, that it has been swept clean, that's in, in an appropriate state for the buyers. I don't want buyers to get mad at the sellers for leaving things behind. Um, your sellers on that canceling utilities for your trash pickup, if your sellers call in enough time in advance, like a week and a half, two weeks in advance to let them know when they're gonna be leaving the property to turn off the trash service. They will actually come and pick up the cans and take them away, including that last like hurrah of shoving stuff in the trash cans, okay? So that way we make sure that the buyers, when they start service, their trash service, they get nice clean cans instead of moving into a house with cans that have been left behind, stuffed full of trash. So I highly recommend to make sure that about two weeks in advance, your sellers call the trash service to cancel that trash service on the day that they're going to pull out. So that they will pick up that one last um, uh, full trash can. The other thing that is really handy for your sellers is if you want to give them a fabulous closing gift, pay for chunk removal on the date that they are supposed to deliver keys or the day before so that all your sellers have to do is they're continuing to pack and going through that panic of like the rush to get things done. They can just throw everything in a pile that they don't want in the driveway or inside the garage. And then that junk hauler will come in and clean it all up for them. I promise you, you will be the hero of the day if that's what you do for your sellers as a closing gift. It's usually like a couple hundred bucks. It's well worth every penny. Okay. Any questions about any of the items on this slide or anything else? All right. In addition to our closing, my sellers have left. They've now handed over the keys. It's a magical time for the buyers, which we don't really care about. But we want to make sure that we have our post-sale systems in place for those sellers. So um, 
consider a thank you gift, right? Thank you for letting me list your home. As always, I did mention about maybe paying for that last trash haul removal at the close of escrow. And then you may want to give them something else. Like, um, you know, some people do, they take the picture of the front of the house and it turns it into like an illustration and they send that to the sellers, like something lasting that they might remember. Um, once the close of escrow happens and the sellers have moved out, both things, sellers can cancel their homeowner's insurance. I usually just shoot them over a text message to remind them to do this. They will get a prorated return on the amount of the insurance that they have yet to use. So um, whatever's left on their policy. You want to make sure you update your contact relationship manager with their new address. Your sellers have moved. They no longer have the same address. Please make sure to update your CRM. And then you always want to ask for feedback, right? How did I do? What could I have done better? And what did I do extremely well? You could do this at the closing table as well. Um, I thought I had that. Oh, sad. All right. I thought it was on here somewhere, but um, now I'm questioning life. But anyways, on your... <laughs> On the steps to successful transaction, the prepare to close. Um, Claudia, I do not have a Google form that's a survey, but that would be a good idea to do the Google form. Um, on prepare to close, that's when your sellers would sign. So once we've negotiated repairs, we're moving through getting those contingencies removed, um, your sellers can sign at any time. I just like to make sure it's a done deal before we go there and that we've negotiated any credits or repairs that might be happening. Um, but then you can reach out to the title company to schedule the sellers to sign. It doesn't have to be like in the last couple of days of the transaction. They can they can sign up to a week, two weeks in advance of the actual closing. So just so everybody knows that. So you want to make sure they sign. You can do that survey or that feedback um, during that closing. You could, if it was a paper form, you could shoot it over to your uh, title or escrow officer and ask them to include that with the closing package. Or if you wanted to use a Google form as uh, Claudia recommended and suggested, I think that's a really good idea. Then you can just shoot it to them as you're moving towards closing um, and ask them to complete the survey. I like to have my feedback before I ask them to leave reviews. I wanna know what that review is gonna say. And if there was something I could have done better, um, I wanna try to fix that before I ask for the review. Um, any questions? about the after the sale follow-up system. And just like my buyers, just so everybody knows on like a thank you gift, if you're gonna provide them with something, I usually wait until a couple weeks after the close of escrow. The buyers get excited because they've got keys in hand. Your sellers are, are busy because they just finished packing up their entire house. And now they're either having to put it in storage or they're moving it into a new house. And so they're busy as well. So. Um, oftentimes I'll wait a couple weeks before sending that thank you gift out so that they remember me. And then that's also a good time to ask for those reviews. Um, in addition, you want to make sure that you have an after sale follow-up system set up in your contact relationship manager. Um, ideally, you would be doing quarterly phone calls and text messages, the monthly newsletter, a monthly market update cards on their anniversaries, birthdays, et cetera, comments on their social media, invitations to events. Your goal would be to connect with them on a minimum of 36 times a year in order to convert them again into a client when they're ready to buy or sell in the future. Okay. Any questions about the contract to close or listing to close process on a listing? Nothing. Everybody's experts. Fabulous. Um, make sure that you complete your one habit each and every week. You want to make sure that you are making three phone calls per day about real estate, that you are adding three people to your database on a daily basis, and that you're sending out those six ideally handwritten notes on a daily basis. And you could send it to those people you're making phone calls to and adding to your database. That's six. If you want to step up your game, you could go 10, 10, and 10. Any other questions or do you need anything? Um, 
inside of the listing or any other topic. And please don't forget to log your attendance. The link is in the chat box. Anything else before we wrap up? We've got plenty of time. We've got 19 minutes. I'm early today. So I would love to know um, how to create the Google Forms in a way to where I guess it's efficient. Um, I've tried doing it and I don't know. I'm not getting notifications if and when they're completed. Okay. Um, I'm going to put Google Forms on here. You should be getting an email that somebody has submitted, but let's see, um, since we've got time, let's see if I can get to my other screen, see if we can find where the notifications are. I think there's a way to set up notifications. So let's, oops. If I can figure out how to get into my Google Drive, we can do this. And then I guess even better, can we just put it directly in our CRM? Is that where it goes for you? Um, it does not um, because the, the forms that I use, number one, I use the MLS input form, which I wouldn't want that into my CRM. And then the second one would be the feedback form. And I'm not sure I'd want that. I'm not sure where it would feed into my CRM either. Um, so well, I don't have it set up to do that. You probably could, um, I was trying to think of what the services that feeds things from like a spreadsheet into your CRM that you could set up. And I'm not coming up with a name. Another way, just so you guys know too, if you don't, if you're having problems with Google Forms, another way to create it um, would be inside of Jot Forms. That's another system that I um, mm -hmm. utilize on a regular basis um, for form type things. So that one's one, it's J-O-T-F-O-R-M, jot form. But let me see if I can find one of my forms. See, and that one's free also. It is free. And you can, um, you know, add pictures to it or kind of do whatever. So I use that a lot of times for like lead generation type forms. All right, so I've got the, oh, here we go, settings, let's go here. So this is my listing input form. So I'm just gonna go into settings and see if we can set it up to be notified or if we can change those settings after it finishes loading. I was like, it's been a while since I've sent this out, but I think I used to get an email. Hold on, I'm trying to make you guys disappear. I don't see it in here. So there may not be... Um, Oh, here, you can get email notification of new responses. You just, uh, when I went to responses, so I went from settings mm -hmm. to responses and clicked on the three little dot and hit get email notifications for new responses. Okay. And you can like view the responses here or I have mine, it's linked up to a Google Sheet. So it throws them all on a Google Sheet so I can look through it that way as well. So it depends how you want to view them. If you had multiple, it would sell you, you had like three responses and then you could scroll through each one here to get to the most recent one. Um, but that would be the easiest way is to get that notification. Well, when you, um, when you hit set, dest I'm sorry, set destination for response, uh -huh. can I see what options are for that? Is it strictly Google? Uh, yeah, you've either got create a new spreadsheet or select existing. So it's just going to okay. allow you to go into a Google sheet. Oh, okay. That's okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then you've got um, jot form. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And on job form, I feel like I ended up getting text messages when people put new entries into here. This is what we used to use for our farm and stuff. If people were going to like donate items, we were running a donation drive or signing up for the garage sale or things like that. We always use job form for that. And then oftentimes I would link it into like a QR code so that you could, they could scan a QR code for access as well as instead of just creating a link. Oh, integrations. Connect your form to other apps, Calendly, ClickUp, Slack, PayPal, Google Sheets, Zoom, Google Drive, Dropbox. Um, see, they're not in alphabetical order. I was hoping I'd see Boomtown. I know. I'm like, this is not convenient. <laughs> um, I was looking to see if I came up with that other name of the one that pulled it in as well. And, uh, I don't know why I'm having a brain fart. And I can't come up with what the name of that system is that pulls things from one to another. You can request the integration. I will do that. I probably could have searched. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, it doesn't have that. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you got integrations, conditions. <clears throat> oh, here, mobile app notifications. Turn on that. Auto responders. I like that. Yeah, I need to do that. Yeah, so jot, the jot form is pretty simple. Um, okay. Like if I went into form builder, let's get back to my home page. Really easy just to hit create form. They have templates you can import, create signable document, right? So we, let's use a template product order form, registration, feedback. Hit use yeah. template. Right, and then you can go in there, you can click on it, it allows you to edit just kind of any piece of it. If we wanted to add an element, you just click the little add button, heading, name, email, right? What do you want to collect from them? Maybe we need their name. And then you could just drag it and readjust where it is. Maybe we want their email, right? So it's super simple. You can do fill in the blanks. You can do short text, long text, paragraph, drop downs single choice, multiple choice. So it's got all the options in there that you can um, support. So it makes it super easy to use this as well. Cool. I, I, I like that. Photos. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. I think in form designer, you can like choose your colors and your themes. Use theme. And so when you did the yard sale um, yep. in this, would you just request their name, email, and you would contact them back about um, like which their actual home address or does that make uh, sense? That's a good question. That was a long time ago, but no, I think we had them put in their address and then what they were um, like, we had 32 submissions for a garage sale. Wow. That's awesome. Um, we had them put in what kind of things would be, they would be selling. Mm. So we got their um, name, their address, their email, their phone number, and items being sold. Mm. Okay. 
Okay. Cause actually Kimberly called me this morning. We were talking about, um, a yard sale she's doing and, yeah. and I was like, I have never done that. I have no idea. So she, um, was going to be reaching out to a few people. So I told her that you had done it. Yeah, we did it. Um, again, we were quite successful over there. We had 32 people register. Um, we purchased like 50, here was our form. So, so you can change up the background. So we made it look like a garage sale in the background and, you know, I was being sold. Sweet. Um, we bought those like stick in the ground signs with just the corrugated cardboard um, that said like amazing garage sale with an arrow. And so mm -hmm. we made sure we had those pointing to each area where there were um, garage sales. We put out all 50 of them. Um, yes, Anastasia, I can do a class on jot forms. And then um, we had little goodie bags that we delivered to each person on the morning of. So mm -hmm. we went around and stopped by each garage sale, introduced ourselves, asked us, asked them how they were doing. We also printed up some maps of where the different garage sales were. And we left those with each party in case they wanted to, somebody wanted um, kind of a, a map of the neighborhood to where those garage sales were. And then in our goodie bags, it was like a garage sale survival bag. There was like some water. And then we got a bunch of donations from vendors like pens and notepads and we put in like a package of pricing labels in case they needed those and just some uh, some snacks some trail mix or something on each one so we just kind of made it like a fun thing um it didn't cost us a whole lot of money the only thing it cost was the initial setup with the signs which um we used them multiple times and you can also because those signs they were branded to us we had our logo on them and they said like amazing garage sale you can offer those up to your other clients that's a great touch you know, form as you're getting into the summer months of, Hey, just a heads up. If you let me know, I've got garage sale signs. Let me know how many, you know, if you're hosting a garage sale in any time, just let me know how many you need. I'm happy to drop them off for you because now you've taken care of that for people, right? That they were like, Oh yeah, can I get 15 garage sale signs? And now they can just go through and stick them in the ground someplace. If we lost a few, it wasn't a big deal because they weren't very expensive. Um, so we had those garage sale signs and then the little packet. And that was really all it cost us out of pocket. Everything else was people running their own garage sale people um we did it the somebody had done it the previous year it wasn't an agent they just organized it we took on the organization of it the next year and then like the year after that which was 2020 so we were in the middle of covid um people were contacting us to ask if we were going to do it hmm. again so it was a good event that's great thank you yeah absolutely any other questions Fabulous. Then I will wrap up for today. We will be back tomorrow. We're going over just sky slope basics. So you have a, a nice understanding of how to operate and function inside of sky slope. Again, um, as we talked about in this lesson, most of the time your transaction coordinator is going to be doing that for you, but you should have a handle of how to do that. So if the transaction coordinator ever got sick or hospitalized or something happened to them, they went on vacation for two weeks and whoever was supposed to be covering failed you wouldn't be dead in the water in your transaction you could still move forward and you could still get paid at the end. So that's the goal there is just to have a basic understanding of how to operate inside a sky slope, which we use for compliance. We'll be covering that tomorrow at four. And then, um, like I said, we've got a couple of freebies. So I'll add in the appraisal training and uh, maybe Google Forms and Jot Form on the same training. So look for those dates to be issued later this week. And then I'm working on the June, July, August calendar. Um, I think we're going to move some times around. I apologize for anybody that's inconvenient for, um, and we'll be running some trainings we've got some title companies coming in to run some more in-depth trainings on some of the tools and systems they offer. We've got some lenders coming in to offer some trainings. Oh, and on Tuesday at three o'clock, if you didn't get the notification already, um, we have uh, Scott from the Nebraska Realty One Group is going to come and go over. He's like a chat GPT expert in how to utilize it to make your real estate business more um, efficient. And he's going to show us some tools and tricks to getting into chat GPT, which is your AI, help you create posts and listing descriptions and all sorts of fun things that you can do with that that you probably didn't even think of. So we'll have that on Tuesday at three o'clock.
join us. Fabulous. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. I'll see you all tomorrow at four.